we know who we work for. We work for patients. We work for their families. We work for anyone impacted by cancer. That's what Friends does. They may not know about us, but they don't have to. We're doing the work accelerating policy change, supporting groundbreaking science, and getting new therapies to people quickly and safely. Too often, cancer breakthroughs can't rise above the noise. Without someone to champion them, life-changing treatments might not reach a patient for years. For so many patients, the drugs they take now only work for so long. The clock is ticking. They need a new treatment, and they need it yesterday. That's why we stay vigilant. That's what Friends does. We bring scientists together with industry and policymakers, unite them with shared trust, and guide them towards meaningful cooperation. Then we get to work, creating the blueprint to build real-world solutions fast. There's no time to waste. Once we set a goal, we push, we pull, we talk, we listen, we advocate, we leave no stone unturned. That's how breakthroughs transpire. That's how better policies happen. That's how patients get what they need. We listen to patients, gather the experts, and within a year, we made breakthrough therapies a reality for thousands. When we did, it changed the culture, shifting the way the system worked for the better. We partnered to design a whole new structure for our clinical trial and broadened entry at unprecedented levels, pioneering one of the most innovative trials ever. We broke down barriers, fought unfair and unnecessary exclusions, and expanded access to clinical trials. We set a new standard for measuring how a patient might respond to a new therapy. We're making research work. We're making legislation work. We're making trials work because we know who we work for and we know what's at stake. So we're not stopping. We'll keep striving for change for patients everywhere. That's what Friends does. Good evening. I'm Ellen Siegel, Chair and Founder of Friends of Cancer Research. On behalf of myself, Vice Chair Marlene Malik, and all of us at Friends, we welcome you to the 24th Annual Cancer Leadership Reception. As you can see, things are a little bit different this year. Who would have imagined that in this century, we would be where we are today because of COVID? However, we're grateful that we can share via Zoom many of our accomplishments over the past year and where we are in the fight against COVID. We are so very thankful that in these extraordinary times that we have such incredible friends and colleagues that support us in so many ways. I'm truly proud of all the outstanding work that Friends does for cancer patients each and every day. Despite all of the challenges we've faced this year, this has not changed. In fact, Friends has accomplished more than ever. I'm proud that I have served on the Friends Board for over 24 years now, and I'm especially honored that I have served with you, Ellen. Thank you for putting patients first. Today, we are honored to welcome some special guests. They are truly heroes, working tirelessly to understand and find a cure for COVID. Thank you, and thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you, Marlene, for being my partner and sister in the fight against cancer for so many years. In these extraordinary times, our staff and partners have been relentless in pushing forward monumental scientific programs and policy initiatives, some of which you will hear more about later. I could not be prouder. Not only are we tackling cancer every day, we have been enlisted by the FDA to be part of the nation's response to combat COVID-19. As Marlene said, we are truly humbled to have some of the busiest and most important people in the world with us this evening. Commissioner Stephen Hahn, Dr. Peter Marks, Dr. Mark McClellan, and Dr. Jana Woodcock, and our very special guests, Dr. Francis Collins and Dr. Tony Fauci. 
to everyone with us for this evening at Home with Friends, I want to express my deep gratitude for your support of the truly life-changing work we do each and every day for patients. To start us off, we are honored to have the 24th Commissioner of the FDA with us this evening. As a country faces unparalleled challenges during this global pandemic, and while cancer still ravages millions, we are lucky to have a dedicated scientist physician who has treated patients at the helm of the agency, Dr. Stephen Hahn. Thank you, Ellen. I'm delighted to be with you virtually today. My admiration for Friends of Cancer Research is profound. As a cancer researcher and clinician, I have experienced firsthand the important role you play in helping to develop new treatments, approaches, and cures. Thank you for all that you do for countless cancer patients around the world. I am particularly proud of the strong, ongoing, collaborative relationship between the FDA and Friends of Cancer Research. This relationship is a model for others. Working together, we have helped spur innovation that has led to new treatments and care options by employing the best available science and drawing on the best scientific minds. As you are well aware, Cancer research has also helped shape and inform many other types of medical research and spurred the development of new and creative treatments in other areas. I want to spend a few moments discussing FDA's ongoing efforts to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. At FDA, we've been immersed in a nonstop effort to address this public health crisis on many different fronts. At the same time, we've been operating at a faster pace than under normal circumstances. I want to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts of the FDA staff who have tirelessly supported the development of safe and effective medical countermeasures, including making sure that our frontline health care workers had and will continue to have the necessary protective equipment. They have provided essential regulatory advice, guidance, and technical assistance needed to advance the development of tests, therapies, and vaccines. And they have been vigilant in seeking to prevent the sale of fraudulent products that could harm the public. They have done all this while maintaining FDA's focus on applying scientific rigor to any decisions being made and basing decisions on the data, no matter how quickly these decisions are made. Remarkably, they have also maintained the FDA's regular mission critical work, continuing to meet our other responsibilities in the cancer space and elsewhere. We are also using new approaches to increase the amount and type of data we are able to evaluate. As you probably know, the data from clinical trials represents only a small portion of the clinical experience that is being generated from the care of COVID-19 patients every day around the nation. So we are turning to new sources, clinical data collected outside of traditional clinical trials, also known as real-world data, can help accelerate FDA's understanding of how COVID-19 is affecting patients and help FDA advise product developers on how to optimize the design of their clinical trials. I am so pleased that the COVID-19 Evidence Accelerator, run by the Reagan Udall Foundation and Friends of Cancer Research, with participation from FDA, has become a great example of how a large group of stakeholders can come together to advance the science of real-world data and answer discrete research questions that can help us respond to the pandemic. We continue to work with many different drug manufacturers and to provide guidance and technical assistance to help expedite the very necessary clinical trials for the development of a vaccine. And we continue our commitment to speeding the development of a vaccine. I want to assure you that we will not cut corners in any decisions that we make regarding the quality, safety, or efficacy of a vaccine, or indeed any medical product. Any decisions we make, whether about vaccines, therapeutics, or anything else, will be based on science and data, not politics. And these decisions will be made by career scientists at the FDA who are experts in the field. Our recent guidance on the development and licensure of vaccines underscores our responsibility to the American people to maintain our regulatory independence and to provide a high level of transparency around those efforts. What this means is that the public can continue to have complete confidence in the work we do. I am very hopeful that we are moving toward a time when we can resume life as we once knew it. Meanwhile, we need to continue the common sense public health measures we've learned are effective at stopping the spread and mitigating outbreaks, such as wearing of masks, social distancing, hand washing, protection of the vulnerable, 
and avoidance of large indoor gatherings, particularly in bars. In closing, I want to thank all of you for your partnership. That partnership substantially helps us in our public health mission. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hahn, for your kind words and for all your efforts during this challenging time. I'm Jeff Allen, President and CEO of Friends of Cancer Research. I first want to say thank you. Each and every one of our board of directors, supporters, collaborators, and friends has made our work possible. This spring, as the world was shifting due to COVID-19, we decided this was no time to be back on our heels. COVID created uncertainty and new challenges, but cancer wasn't going away. Through the spring, our projects moved full steam ahead, and over the summer, we presented the results from three of our major partnerships. Those results are already changing how new medicines are being developed. And as we accelerate how we distribute those results, we are now rapidly communicating that science and policy work to tens of thousands across the globe. While I know all of you are here to hear from our esteemed guests, I wanna share a couple of programs that will be driving friends into 2021. What sets friends apart is our collaborations. Our projects bring diverse experts together. Sometimes they may even be competitors, but through our projects, data is shared, transparency is fostered, and progress is made. We've shown that this model works for cancer research, and now we're using it to address aspects of COVID-19. When it comes to accelerating discoveries that can help patients, we believe that together we'll move further faster. An example of this is CT Monitor, one of the largest scale scientific endeavors in Friends history. Through this collaboration with multiple universities, drug developers, test makers, patient advocates, and government experts, we set out to assess the ability of a rapid and easy to use blood test to monitor treatment response. This unique partnership has already demonstrated the potential for circulating tumor DNA in the blood to be an indicator of whether treatment is working earlier than is currently possible. This is just one example of the impressive scientific and policy portfolio of friends. And I wanna stress that none of this can be done without your support. With your support at events like this tonight and throughout the year, I'm proud to announce that we're building on CT Monitor, forging new research partnerships and working with policymakers to ensure that patients are getting new treatments in the fastest and safest way possible. And now, please join me from your home in welcoming Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Francis Collins. So, hey, Tony. Good to see you, even though we're, as usual, not in the same room, but seems like we've spent more time on Zoom talking to each other or on the telephone every night when we're catching up on stuff. Yeah. Nice to have a chance to talk about all this for the Friends of Cancer Research. How you doing? I'm doing fine, Francis. Uh, for those who don't know that Francis and I now see and talk to each other literally every day, sometimes twice a day. So the fact that the NIH leadership is very heavily involved, not only in coronavirus research, but all the other implications and spin-offs that have occurred because of that. So here we are. Here we are. So Tony, this is a 25th anniversary of Friends of Cancer Research, uh, this remarkable organization that has done a lot to advance the cause of cancer research and clinical trials and advances that we're all pretty excited about, all of which have taken a hit like everything else this year uh, with COVID-19 becoming such a prominent part of our agenda and keeping people from necessarily working in the lab the way they might like to just for safety reasons. Maybe we could just start out and, and just provide a little bit of background about why has this pandemic been so different uh, than other things that you've worked with in your 36 years uh, leading NIH's uh, infectious disease enterprise like H1 and N1 and Ebola and Zika. Why has this one become so completely consuming of all of us? Well, Francis, you know, it, it gets back to what you and I have spoken about over the years. We used to have conversations where you would ask me, Tony, from an ID standpoint, what would be your worst nightmare? What would be the thing that keeps you up at night? Uh, we've gotten asked that at cocktail parties and at congressional hearings, they ask us the same question. <laughs> well, you know, what it is, as I've said it, and unfortunately now it's come true, is that the concern is that you have a brand new virus that the population of the world has had no experience with, 
jumping species generally from an animal. That's a respiratory borne illness that has two confluent characteristics. One is that it's highly, highly transmissible from person to person. And two, that it has a high degree of morbidity and mortality, either in the general population, which would be horrible, or for a selected group for which is particularly serious. And we've seen versions of outbreaks that have had one or the other of those characteristics, but not both of them. But then when you put them both together, you have a virus that has jumped species from an animal reservoir. It has immediately has the characteristic of incredible efficiency of spread from human to human. However, it also has a high degree of morbidity and mortality among the elderly and those with underlying conditions. And we know that now. The numbers speak for themselves, Francis. We now have tens of millions of infections worldwide, going right up to about a million deaths. In the United States, 6,700,000 infections. And tomorrow, we will have 200,000 deaths. It's 199,745 as of the last thing that we said. So by the time that people will be listening to what we're saying, it will be over 200,000. So that's something that is devastating. Devastating because the only way when you don't have a vaccine of stopping something that has such incredible efficiency is to shut down, to shelter in place. That is unsustainable for an indefinite period of time because it will crush the economy, which in many respects, it already has severely damaged the economy, damaged not only the economy, but what you mentioned, research coming to a halt, cancer screening slowing down, HIV drug delivery slowing down, testing for colon cancers slowing down, you know, mammograms slowing down. We've got to get back to some form of normality. And I think the only way we're going to do that, Francis, is a combination of both a safe and effective vaccine and continuing some aspects of public health care. That may be masks for another year until we get the, the population vaccinated. So it's, it's really unprecedented, Francis. Yeah, so talk a little bit more about what we have in store for us coming over the next few months. First of all, let's say that the scientific progress on therapeutics and vaccines uh, has been unprecedented, bringing together partners in the public and the private sector, doing things through warp speed on vaccines that has never been attempted at this speed and scale before. But even in the best of all outcomes, uh, you just mentioned, we're probably not gonna be all done with this no. uh, in January. So, so walk through what would be you know, a realistic perspective so that people listening to this can kind of get themselves prepared. Okay, so as you well know, since you're deeply involved with it with us, we now are, are involved in either development of or facilitation in the testing of at least six candidates, three of which are already in phase three trial in, in really extraordinary speed. Remember, the, the sequence of this virus was only made known on January 10th. We began work on the first vaccine on January 15th. 62 days later, we were in phase one trial. Six months later, we were in phase three trial. Right now, we have three phase three trials. One is on hold now because of a serious adverse event that occurred in the UK, but two of them are going right now full speed. One will join in another week or two, another in another month or two. But let's look at the two that are already in phase three trial and are almost fully enrolled. We project that given the number of infections we're seeing, and the number of people in the trial, it goes anywhere from 30,000 to 44,000 to one trial projects 60,000 people in the trial, that we will have an answer whether we have a safe and effective vaccine, I would say by November, December. Is it possible we'll know in October? Certainly it's possible, likely November, December. What has happened that is totally unique is that all of the companies have been given literally hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to produce vaccine at risk so that by the time we get to a point where we have knowledge that we have a safe and effective vaccine, pick your month, 
October, maybe unlikely, November, December, January, we already have in place the doses that are going to be ready to be distributed. Now, even though we have hundreds of millions of doses and will, in the combination of all the companies, will have about 700 million doses, which is most of them a prime boost. So 328, 330 million people in the USA, we could theoretically vaccinate everybody. There are a couple of issues with that. The first is that all of those vaccines have to be approved in order for them to be released from the stockpile where you have it into the pharmacies and the distribution places. So you can't say we have one vaccine that gets approved. You don't have 700 million doses of that vaccine. You have 700 million of the total of all the vaccines. So we're going to have multiple vaccines in play. One of the issues that people don't appreciate is that even though theoretically you could vaccinate everybody in a couple of months, the fact is we know from experience that people even with a vaccine that you would think they really feel they need, the hesitancy for everybody to get vaccinated until you see we have 20 million, 50 million, 100 million, and things look good. The infection rate starts to go down a bit, not completely, but it goes down a bit. There are not a lot of effects that people worry about. Then everybody's going to start to want to get vaccinated. That likely won't take place completely until the end of the first half, the beginning of the third quarter of 2021. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the questions that people have asked, when we get there at that point, unless you have a measles-like vaccine, which is 98% effective, let's say you have a 70% effective vaccine, you have to be careful because that means you can't completely abandon public health measures. It's going to be a combination of public health measures and a good vaccine. Let's say 70% we consider we'll take that. That's a good vaccine, which means 70% of the people who get vaccinated are protected. You may have a lot of people who don't want to get vaccinated, which means numerically you have some people out there that are vulnerable, and particularly a vaccine that can be very serious, I mean a virus that can be very serious for the elderly and those who have underlying conditions, we may not get back to a degree of, quote, normality until the end of 2021, even though we've done rocket speed in getting the vaccines. Well, that's realistic, maybe a little sobering to people who just want this to be over, but we have to think and plan accordingly. In terms of what this does for research, Tony, because obviously uh, you and I are both grieving, I think, a bit about what's happened to the rest of our research engine, having to send our researchers home for their own safety, and even now at NIH, letting people come back, but very carefully, uh, so that they maintain physical distances, they wear masks all the time. My own lab is sort of running shifts so that people can do some work, but they're not all there at the same time, and many people are going slowly because you know they're only there three days a week instead of six or seven. When do you think uh, we might be able to start to really activate again uh, the full court press on all of the other research challenges? Well, let's talk about cancer because we're speaking to the friends of cancer research and get that back where it needs to be to make progress because we were making progress and then this came along and everything had to go slow for a while. You know, I think we could safely do that because we have a population of workers here our colleagues who take this very seriously. And we know that we could probably get back with things like mask wearing and not congregating together a lot and still get people back in the lab more safely. Because once we start vaccinating people, I would think by the end of the first half of 2021, we can see what we're doing almost back to normal. That's different and whether you're going to get people crowded into a theater or you're going to have a big reception where people are going to want to be without masks. I think we could do our work with masks at a much, much ex more extensive level than we're doing now by the end of the first half of 2021. People are trying to look at silver linings here. And goodness knows it would be great to discover some. And one uh, in the delivery of healthcare has been how telemedicine has 
been adopted uh, at a much more rapid pace than it was before because it was, in many instances, the only option where you could deliver health care. And we've seen that taking place uh, in things like, for instance, the addiction centers where they couldn't have people coming in, yet they're still taking care of people. But also in just primary care, my daughter's a primary care doc in North Carolina, and she's just as busy as ever, but she hardly ever has a patient in the same room with her. But do you think there are going to be long-term consequences uh, of this kind of shift in the way we do research and the way we deliver healthcare because we won't really want to go back to the way things were? We'll figure out there's some more efficiencies here? No, I think we will. You know, Francis, there is always... Um the advantage of being person to person when you want to develop collaborations. But the one thing that I'm realizing now, um, who had never done any Zoom at all, I, I, I you know, I, as you well know, <laughs> I'm not the, the computer geek that I'd like to be, that there are <laughs> things that we can do to save a lot of time. Because sometimes, Francis, you and I make trips, and when we're there, we could just as easily have done it this way, the way you and I are doing it. There are certain things you really want to be in the same room. You want to develop a collaboration. You want to go out to dinner with the people, solidify the things that you and I have done through the years of our career. But there are certain things that really don't require that. They just require people chatting with each other and, and setting up uh, screen sharing and, and taking a look at data, which I find in some instances works just as well. I don't want to give up the, comp, the contact that we have, but I think a lot of things that we do, we may wind up getting more efficient. If you think about the amount of time you spend going to an airport, waiting to board, waiting for the delay in the flight, flying there, getting to the hotel, waking up and have a meeting, when you could just do it this way. You don't wanna do everything that way, but I think there's gonna be not only telemedicine, I think in some respects, scientific, communication might actually get even better when you could save some time like we're doing right now. Yeah, no, I have to agree. <clears throat> I have not missed all those uh, hours that I would normally be spending on airplanes and in strange hotels where I never get to sleep very well anyway. So this is probably, it's unleashed us, hasn't it, to work even more hours every week like I know you are and I guess I am too here in my home office at Chevy Chase. Well, Tony, run the clock forward a little bit. Uh, let's let's say it's now 2023, and um, what do you think things will look like at that point as far as medical research? Are, are you going to be willing to make a projection about what infectious disease challenges will be in front and how will they be dealt with? Well, I think if we have a corporate memory of the kind of preparedness that we should have had for this, some, some was good. I mean, I think the platform technologies that many of our colleagues here at NIH have developed have allowed us to do things in months that took years to do. But I think that we need to have a better health systems that can handle at the local level things that we don't handle very well right now. But if I look ahead and I look at the technologies that we've developed, Francis, I think, for example, if we get an HIV vaccine, that'll be fine. It's gonna be very difficult for a lot of reasons that you and I have spent a lot of times discussing. But the thing that is extraordinary is what we're seeing with long acting PrEP. In other words, things that you could take an injection every six months and sometimes once a year while you are in a risk situation, I think that that would be almost as good if not better than a vaccine. So I think we're going to see an extraordinary turnaround in the number of cases of HIV. Secondly, I'm very pleased, and this was unfortunately interrupted by COVID-19, the advances that are being made in vaccines for both tuberculosis as well as in malaria. So as you know, you and I had a long conversation when you became the director of the NIH and you put together your, your goals and, and I remember it well, one of them was global health and you and I had the conversation that if we could walk away from this place with vaccines for the three big killers, HIV, tuberculosis and malaria, that would really be a good feeling. I think we can be close to that 
in four or five years from now. I do. I really do. Well, that would be indeed wonderful. I know people listening to this also wondering about other areas of research. Where will we be? I just would say, as we get the chance to unleash all of that capability, I think we can also build on some of the relationships that have been strengthened as a result of COVID-19. Certainly some of the things we've done <coughs> across academic centers, in terms of our partnerships with industry through the active partnership, which has been amazing with 20 pharmaceutical companies working in a seamless fashion with NIH and academic centers and CDC and FDA and the Veterans Administration and the DOD and all of that managed very capably by the foundation for NIH. Those kinds of uh, frameworks uh, for moving research forward more quickly since they have worked so well, I hope we can continue to adopt them. And for cancer research, I've been so excited about the progress uh, that has been made with genomics and the way in which that has allowed us to begin to practice precision medicine for the selection of the right drug for the right person at the right dose in the right time, but also the cancer immunotherapy revolution, which I think still has a great deal of excitement in front of it and figuring out exactly why does it work when it works and why does it not work when it doesn't and how can we take immunotherapy even beyond where it has been so powerful for things like melanoma and leukemias and lymphomas and get it to work for solid tumors. There's no reason I can see why that is not an achievable goal. In three years from now, I think we will probably have made a lot of progress in that space if we can just unleash the power uh, of our remarkable research community by getting them back um, into where they wanna be uh, working on these problems. Well, one of the things I can think of, uh, Francis, that we need to pay attention to. I mean, there are the big things like vaccines and therapeutics, but there's something that has informed all of that, and that's what we call the pathogenesis of the disease. I'm getting concerned about the longer range effects of people who have a mild to moderate uh, uh, illness, where they may be in bed for a week or two or three, how long symptoms last, something like the brain fog or the difficulty concentrating, myalgias, fevers, all when they're viral negative, this post-viral syndrome, more and more people that you question have that. The other thing that I think is going to be important is that a couple of studies have come out that's quite disturbing to me, that they looked at individuals who had clinical disease, some moderate, not even requiring hospitalization, and some in the hospital where after they recovered and were relatively asymptomatic, in a paper that was published from Germany in JAMA Cardiology, they did MRIs on their heart and found that 60 to 70% of people had evidence of inflammation in the heart. Now, they weren't symptomatic with it, but you have to be careful because those are the things that could lead to, could lead to, Arrhythmia is unexplained in the future, coronary artery disease unexplained, importantly, cardiomyopathies. So we are doing at the NIH long range studies of follow up of individuals for years after they recover, looking specifically at things like cardiovascular and neurological abnormalities. So in addition to the get better or die situation, there's a big in between thing there that we better be humble enough and modest enough to realize we still have a lot to learn in addition to developing vaccines and to developing therapies. Well, that's a really important point. I guess if I had to pick one, although people have heard about it, I don't think they've heard enough about it, is how this particular disease has hit certain communities with a particular vengeance. And that's particularly people who have chronic illnesses, the elderly, but it is also people who live in the lower socioeconomic status situations. And that particularly applies to a lot of African-American and Latinx communities. And this is shining a bright light on something which we have been aware of, but maybe haven't paid enough attention to, which is that our healthcare system in this country is riddled with health disparities and health inequities. And here comes this disease along and it makes it so clear that not everybody has the same access to the opportunity to stay healthy. We need to learn from that. We need to move swiftly to identify ways to try to protect uh, those particular communities from things getting even worse. And we have programs right now to try to be sure we're getting diagnostic tests 
that are point of care out there to be able to quickly identify who's infected and isolate them so that these diseases don't spread the way that the COVID-19 has. But we also need to use this as an opportunity to recognize the way in which our whole system uh, needs a revamping when it comes to the equities or the inequities of healthcare. We need not to miss this moment uh, to act upon that. Totally agree, Francis. Tony, you have been such a gift uh, to the public, uh, to NIH, uh, to the world, and this incredibly challenging, difficult time, the worst pandemic in more than 100 years. And I am grateful to you, and I know everybody listening is, for your stance uh, of speaking the truth about what we know and what we don't know, as well as your remarkable scientific leadership of trying to be sure that everything we could think about in terms of tackling COVID-19 is happening through your remarkably capable staff and all the relationships that you have nurtured over the years. So we are truly fortunate at a crisis like this uh, to have a leader like you. I know it wasn't part of your plan for 2020 and it wasn't mine either, but I'm glad you are in the middle of this, uh, directing it in such an effective way. With that, I will sign off and uh, thank you, Tony, and uh, let the uh, Friends of Cancer Research have at you. Thank you very much, Francis. It's been uh... A great pleasure working with you, and I look forward to the continuation of this partnership. And just, you know, remember, I think you and I have been lo around long enough to realize that some of the things that we thought were unimaginable and impossible uh, a couple of decades ago have come true. So I think when you talk about advances in cancer research, infectious disease, neurological diseases, there's nothing that is beyond what I think science can do. So we just got to keep plugging away. All right. Thanks a lot, Francis. All right. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you for that really important conversation, Dr. Collins. I'm Ryan Homan, Vice President of Friends of Cancer Research. Again, apologies for all the delays this evening. I want to thank Dr. Fauci uh, for that conversation, for sticking around and answering a couple of questions with us this evening. Great to see you, Dr. Fauci. Good to be with you, Ryan. Thank you for having me with you. Thank you. You and Dr. Collins have shared a lot of important information. You're one of the busiest people in the world, so we won't keep you long. I will say when the thousands that signed up for this heard you take a few questions, uh, we got a lot of questions, but every time before they put forth their question, they said, make sure you tell Dr. Fauci, thank you for all you're doing for the country. So on behalf of all of us at Friends and around the country, thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, our first question for you, Dr. Fauci, comes from your friend, Ellen Siegel. Hey, Tony, and thank all of you for sticking with us. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I guess we live in Zoom world today, and this is what happens. Tony, before I ask a question, I have to and want to give deep gratitude for all that you're doing and have done and the work that over the uh, decades and decades of public service and public health. You are a national treasure, an international treasure, and thank you so much. We are so appreciative of everything you're doing, and particularly now in COVID when we need you desperately. Um, as you know, there's a lot of concern about science and the politicalization of science and its concerns to all of us, and a lot of information about the vaccine that people do not understand and the process of the vaccine and what it means and all the steps. And one of them particularly is the, uh, the Data Science Monitoring Committee, DSMB, and what that means. And I think there's a lot of information that the public would actually benefit if you can take us through that and take us through the process. It would be enormously helpful. So again, great thank you to you for everything and just help us understand what that means. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ellen. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on this program and thank you for that very important question. So we have now, uh, I had said three in the conversation with Francis, but we're now up to five of the six vaccines that the federal government is making a major investment is in fact in phase three trial. Uh, each of those trials, has what we call a common data and safety monitoring board. And that stands for what we call the DSMB. It's an independent board that is beholden to no one politically, not to the FDA, not to the company, not to the president, 
not to the Congress. It's an independent board made up of scientists, vaccinologists, statisticians, and ethicists. And it's a traditional way that we guarantee that science drives the process. Because this independent group meets at predetermined times to look at the data from those trials that I mentioned are already ongoing. And each of those trials has a protocol of a predetermined point when one can declare whether it's effective or not, as well as obviously looking for safety. And in that situation, the only person who can see the data is the unblinded statistician from the Data and Safety Monitoring Board. And when that person looks at the data intermittently, they can come to one of four, well, three important conclusions. A, the data are fine, but you don't have enough to make a conclusion. Keep the study going. Or we're looking at the data now, and my goodness, there seems to be more infections in the virus group, excuse me, in the vaccine group than in the placebo. So we better stop this because it's not safe. Or what we would hope happens is that eventually when you look at the data, you'd say, we've got it. There is such a difference between the placebo and the vaccine group that we can declare that this vaccine has met the predetermined specifications for efficacy. In fact, we can even tell you statistically how effective it would be. At that point, the data is available to the company, which then looks at the data and likely will do one of two things. We'll go to the FDA for either an emergency use authorization or for a BLA, an actual licensure, a biological license application. And so the FDA now gets their career scientist, again, not political people, looking at that data and analyzing it independently. They then share the data with another advisory committee called the VERPAC committee, which again is another independent committee that advises the FDA. The FDA commission has vowed publicly that he would not let any political considerations influence determinations about safety, efficacy, and licensure, be that emergency or BLA. And when that happens, those data become public, Ellen, which means scientists like myself, scientists like Francis Collins and all of our colleagues have access to them. So there's a lot of transparency in the process. It's science driven and it's evaluated by people who have no political influence or no political stake at anything. It's the independent scientific group. And because of that, I expressed confidence and I do, that in fact, the FDA will do what they've done so well for such a long period of time they will look at the science and make their decision based upon the evaluation of the science of the efficacy and the science of the safety. So important, very important. Our next question uh, tonight comes from uh, a friend of friends, uh, Penny Abramson. Dr. Fauci, on behalf of the non-scientific community, I really want to thank you wholeheartedly for all that you're doing and um, your, your, your influence. Um, and also, I want to tell you that I'm not getting the vaccine until you and Ellen Siegel get it, so I'll know that it's good. Uh, can you please explain more of what will happen once we get a vaccine authorized by the FDA? Who is likely to get it first? And how will the public know when they should seek it out over the months after? Okay, so let me just introduce that, uh, my answer to saying that we are making projections that we will know whether a vaccine is safe and effective uh, sometime around November, December. It could be early, it's conceivable it could be October, but my projection and that of my colleagues is more likely November, December. There's never a guarantee that it's gonna be safe and effective, but I have a cautious optimism based on preliminary data that I've looked at in animals, as well as the preliminary phase one data, that this is a vaccine, vaccines plural, that induce good response that you would predict would be protective. Now, what has happened is that in order to at risk proceed, at financial risk, not safety risk, 
the federal government has invested hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to make doses so that when the decision is made in either November or December, we can begin vaccinating people. So specifically to your question, when you start off and you don't have the 700 million doses that you will need for a prime boost for every American, how do you prioritize? It's a time-honored process. It's the CDC ultimately makes the decision upon advice of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. This is standard. We do it all the time. Another layer has been added to that because of the seriousness of the COVID-19 is that the NIH and the CDC have asked, excuse me, NIH and the CDC have asked the National Academy of Medicine to put together a group to supplement and complement that decision-making process. When that process is made, we don't know who they are gonna be, but it is likely based on other situations that we've been in, that healthcare providers will be prioritized to get it early, if not first, because they put themselves at risk. Secondly, it's those who are at risk for serious consequences, the elderly, those with underlying conditions. And then you go down the line until you get to everybody else, the normal healthy people who are not at increased risk. So it's a prioritization that's standard when you're dealing with a vaccine that initially will be in short supply, but eventually everyone will be able to get the vaccine. So important. Uh, I promised I wouldn't keep you long. Uh, so again, thank you, thank you. Uh, take care and we'll see you soon, Dr. Fauci. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for having me. It's good to be with you. I'm now honored to turn the evening over to another incredible leader, uh, former FDA commissioner, former CN administrator, and director of the Duke Margolis Center, uh, Dr. Mark McClellan. Uh, Ryan, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be part of this evening. And uh, let me add to the congratulations for 25 years of friends, uh, Ellen, Jeff, the entire friends team doing critical work in support of the advancement of science that makes a real difference for patients. And that includes critical support for the mission of the Food and Drug Administration. This is a time when we really see how important it is to have such a strong science-based agency supporting the, the nation's public health. And I'm very pleased in turn to be here with uh, not only you, but two of those FDA veterans whose work is so important to the nation right now. Dr. Janet Woodcock, who's been the director of FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and advisor to the commissioner, who's now overseeing therapeutics for Operation Warp Speed. And Peter Marks, the director of FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, which is right at the center uh, of that process on getting to safe and effective vaccines that you just heard so much about from Dr. Fauci. Um, Janet, I'd like to start with a few questions for you tonight. Um, can you help us get past the name Operation Warp Speed and and talk about what Operation Warp Speed is doing? And you know, we we're going we've talked about and we're going to talk more about vaccines in a few minutes, but why the focus that you're leading on therapeutics and preventive treatments is also really important. Well, first of all, I'd like to say I feel really comfortable with what I'm doing. I think it's the right thing to do. And if you think about it, the government, people would expect their government to try and help them uh, develop treatments as well as vaccines and to do that in the most effective way possible. And that's really what we're doing. Operation Warp Speed is looking at developing treatments and preventives as well as vaccines. And it's helping them move faster by putting those resources against the development. As Dr. Fauci said, not only the manufacturing, which usually comes later and takes longer, uh, but also the clinical trials, bolstering up those clinical trials, helping um, you know get the patients in, doing everything possible to get these evaluated as quickly as possible. So that's that's what Operation Warp Speed is doing. And of course, we had to pick out for treatments and preventives. We had to pick out the most promising uh, therapeutics 
to focus on because there's a huge range of them. Mm -hmm. And in terms of those therapeutics that you're prioritizing, um, any that you'd particularly like to highlight? You know, this has been such a complex disease. It's been hard to find a silver bullet, uh, even if vaccines are effective. You know, there are lots of people who aren't able to, to mount a good uh, immune response. What kinds of therapeutics are you uh, focusing on right now? Well, from the beginning of starting Operation Warp Speed Therapeutics, we focus on antiviral compounds. And uh, one of those is the antibody therapy. So we want vaccines to make antibodies, but if you don't have a vaccine, uh, maybe we can give you antibodies and prevent you from getting the uh, virus or treat you if you have it. And um, those monoclonal antibodies and other types of antibodies are looking like they you know, are very, very promising. We just had an announcement today from Regeneron that their early trial in people who were not yet hospitalized showed that giving them an antibody cocktail, like two antibodies together, um, decreased their virus, shortened their illness, and, and, um, and so forth. And so these are the early signs, in fact, that uh, not only that antibodies may work, and are very promising, but that vaccines are going to work because, um, you know, you, we've showed that antibodies can actually have an impact on the disease. And Lilly also, which is another uh, manufacturer working with Operation Warp Speed, also announced uh, a little while ago that they, they their early trial showed that um, possibly they can decrease hospitalizations, uh, especially of people at high risk when they give them an antibody infusion. So we're working on that. We're working on antiviral compounds, in other words, pills <laughs> that you can take, all right, that uh, fight the virus, and also then a lot of late-stage uh, treatments or managing the complications like anticoagulants and things to deal with the severe cases where people are on the ventilator. So I think there's a lot of promise and hope uh, the uh, there's been a great deal of improvement in the management of people once they're sick with uh, COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic and the number of people who are dying is going down. And I think we can really make an impact on that. And I also think we can probably treat people who aren't in the hospital in, in ways uh, that prevent them from getting seriously ill until which time we get everybody vaccinated. Well, that, that's all good to hear. Can you say a little bit more about the, the process that you're going through and how you're getting that kind of acceleration or rapid pace without cutting corners? Uh, for example, you mentioned in the monoclonal antibody studies reported today, those were, I think you said, early stage results. So they showed that people had an immune response, uh, maybe some suggestive findings on uh, maybe reducing uh, severity of disease, but but you're looking for more, right? There, there are larger clinical trials coming, and, and can you say what you're doing to make that process go as quickly as feasible without cutting corners? Sure. We're working with the manufacturers, obviously, uh, and they're doing some of their own trials, but we're also working with the active group and NIH and NAID to have some very large, what are called master protocols. And these are protocols or clinical trials that can test more than one product. And so they can share a control group. That sounds very strange, but <laughs> if you're not into this, but um, they, it's more efficient, but no corners are cut there. And the plan is both for inpatients and outpatients, we have these master protocols and we plan to test multiple agents. And we're putting government resources into that so we can make those trials as large as possible, enroll as many people as possible, which is a very good thing to do uh, anyway, but that will get us the data that we need to show whether or not these uh, work well enough and how safe they are. And, and doing it as quickly as possible by enrolling more patients in this master kind of standard approach. How are we doing on implementing those, those protocols, Janet? I mean, it does seem like even with the efforts underway at warp speed, you know, this country is the number one supplier of uh, COVID-19 cases in the world. 
And just as in so many other areas of biomedical research, it seems like the vast majority of people aren't making it into to clinical trials where we really do have important questions to answer. Uh, are, are there things that we can do now beyond the pandemic to, to, to enable us to learn more faster? I think um, that we need to do some very serious soul searching after this is over. Uh, right now, the situation with uh, clinical trials for this disease is like starvation in the midst of plenty. Um, there are competition for patients at major medical centers, and yet people are, being, are sick and dying all over the country, and they don't have access to clinical trials. So... Uh, also, there's a large number of trials going on that are not going to yield actionable data. From FDA, we've looked at this and we think only about 6% of all the trials that are trial arms that are going on will yield actionable data because most of them are random. So, so we're in the midst of a pandemic and 6% uh, of all of these hundreds of trials that are underway, that's all we expect to get meaningful results out of? That is correct. They're either they're not randomized, and so we won't be able to draw firm conclusions, or they're underpowered. And as I said, they're under enrolling. They aren't enrolling enough patients, and so we have these very small trials. And I think we really need to think about how we have a much more robust, um, standardized process in the United States for gathering clinical evidence. Yeah, sounds like a really important topic for friends, for all of us to work on. I know uh, friends has tried to bring that pro master protocol concept to uh, oncology, but uh, boy, right. we could use it now. Um, Janet, thanks for taking the time with us. Be before um, I turn to Peter, I do want to ask you, you you've been at FDA for literally decades. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember us having a lot of discussions about very tough issues, including uh, SARS, coronavirus, back in, in 2003. Um, there's been a lot of discussion lately about uh, questions about whether FDA is going to to, to uh, be able to act appropriately with we're in a political season, lots of pressure on the agency. Um, what are your thoughts about this, having having been there and having so much experience at FDA? I have absolute confidence that they're going to do the right thing. I have no concerns about that. These are professional staff. They've been in many, many uh, controversial situations, and they apply their best scientific judgment. We have experienced virologists, infectious disease docs, pharmacologists, you name it, the manufacturing people, they're going to do the right thing. And I think we can rely upon them to render the correct judgments. Janet, thanks for all you're doing. I want to turn now to uh, discussing some of these important issues about vaccines with Peter Marks. Before I do, though, I, I want to just add to, to Janet's comments about the professionalism, the expertise, the well-established support systems that the FDA has put in place for decades to make sure yes. uh, that we do the right thing at for science at critical times like this. And I just want to point out to all of you that uh, this doesn't happen all that often, but along with six other former FDA commissioners, from David Kessler through Scott Gottlieb through five administrations in three decades, uh, we just wrote an op-ed that's up at the Washington Post now, will be out tomorrow, highlighting the importance of avoiding political interference in FDA science-based processes. But the other key point in that op-ed is that just like you heard from Janet, we all have full confidence in that vaccine development is on track, for all of the kinds of reasons that you've heard tonight from Janet, from Tony Fauci earlier. Uh, so Janet, uh, thank you for all you're doing to get the FDA in this position. We're really lucky to have the agency right now. And uh, Peter, uh, with that, I'd like to, uh, to turn to you to talk a little bit more about where we're headed with vaccine development from here. Tony uh, provided some overview of, of what may happen next. And he talked about the usual full approval of a vaccine, so the full FDA uh, regulatory review and so forth, and also about an emergency use authorization, uh, uh, a, uh, an authority that FDA has that was actually created for public health emergencies uh, like this one. Can you talk a little bit about why, an FDA, why the FDA might be considering an emergency use authorization for a vaccine right now? Right, so those who are, uh, are essentially throwing uh, around the term that you have to have a biologics license application 
uh, and you shouldn't use an emergency use authorization in this kind of setting of the vaccine, they simply don't understand the nature of a biologic license application for a vaccine. Um, that they underestimate what goes into these. Um, a biologics license application is essentially a blueprint for everything from the manufacturing to the manufacturing facilities uh, to everything about that vaccine that we uh, can get from the manufacturer. And they tend to be uh, documents that can be not just tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of pages long. And um, they uh, take a long time to put together, you can imagine, to put that all together. And they actually take a long time for us to review. Now, they are what we should have as the gold standard because we must have confidence in the vaccines uh, that are, are approved in this country. Um, they need to be quality vaccines that are safe and effective. But in a time of a pandemic, I think this uh, what Congress gave us was the ability to use emergency use authorization. Um, now, we use that in different settings. We use that for therapeutic products where they're being used to treat patients who have a disease. And the standard was set at a lower bar uh, than our typical um, substantial evidence of effectiveness standard. It was set, set at the product uh, may be effective um, and that the known and potential benefits outweigh the known and potential risks. But for a vaccine, um, we're going to be using an emergency use authorization in a different way than that. We're going to be using it really as a way of ensuring that a vaccine has the proper information that makes us feel confident that it's going to do what it can do and what it should do, uh, which is help prevent disease. Uh, and uh, the idea here is to have uh, the data that will go into um, uh, our emergency use authorization, if that's what we decide to, the action we decide to undertake, um, will need to come from a well-designed, large phase three trial uh, that shows clear and compelling efficacy of the vaccine. And with that in hand, we would feel comfortable using an emergency use authorization uh, to allow us to move forward more quickly on the key elements uh, that will potentially save lives. Yes, it would be nice to have all of the bells and whistles that we normally have uh, for a biologics license application. Uh, but what we may lack in terms of some of the safety data in terms of length of follow-up, we intend to make up through enhanced pharmacovigilance, that's enhanced safety monitoring after the vaccine is put out there. Um, and we have to balance this crucially against the following. Every day, a thousand or more people are dying in this country. From everything I see, um, and I'll obviously defer to those more knowledgeable like the Dr. Fauci's of the world, things aren't getting better right now. They're in the wrong direction. So we have to balance um, this need to perhaps have the most certainty we could about safety with the need to get something to people uh, that is safe to, to everything we can see and effective uh, uh, that will potentially help bring this under control. And the, the idea of waiting months for somebody to put together a license application and us to review it when uh, potentially uh, we could have uh, the application of a safe and effective vaccine, uh, that, that would be, I think, not a good public health maneuver. Thanks, Peter. And does that, it sounds like um, in terms of for practical purposes, the safety and effectiveness standard that you're talking about here may be different, perhaps in the length of safety follow-up, which you said you're going to make up for with additional, something you have authority to do under the emergency use authorization, additional data collection. Does that mean the vaccine uh, along the lines of what Dr. Fauci was talking about might first be uh, made available under the authorization for higher risk groups, or, or how do you see that unfolding? Yeah, I think I think we're going to look at the data. I I I don't want to say I, who it's going to be made available to because that may be more of a decision by the 
uh, it's the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. It may be that the manufacturers come in with data that allow us to provide a relatively broad label for the vaccine, but it may be that the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices feels that it should be first deployed in certain populations. And obviously, whatever population it's deployed in, we will gather as much safety information as we possibly can. We'll probably also be looking at efficacy information as well, using large databases such as the Sentinel system and a related system called BEST, which not only accesses claims, but also can access the electronic medical records for a subset of those claims. Mm -hmm. And Peter, FDA's guidance uh, on this whole emergency use and, and other processes related to the vaccine has been in the news uh, a lot these days uh, with some questions about whether the guidance that the agency has reportedly drafted related to emergency use authorization for COVID vaccines is actually going to be released. Now, um, from my experience, guidance is usually is generally something that industry wants, that the public wants for more clarity about the guidance that you're providing for industry. But you've been providing ongoing guidance throughout this whole process to vaccine developers. Could you talk a little bit about the key things in the guidance that you've provided to companies developing vaccines as we look yeah. forward from here? Yeah, there's, there's, there's no, this, this, uh, the reason why there's no reason to, there's, there's no there there about this guidance to get all excited. The, the, the companies know what we were expecting. Um, this guidance was being done. The most important thing that I think I can do and I can help do in the coming months is to help generate trust, regain trust in vaccines. Vaccines have saved public health previously. They will save it again. Um, we just are going to have to believe in them. And, and so anything we can do to help um, and, and gender trust in the process is critical. So this guidance was an attempt to help the public see what we were requiring of uh, COVID-19 vaccines so that they understood that, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to be careful to say this, but in, in many ways, much of what we're doing here is these vaccines need to be the moral equivalent of of getting as close we could if they're given under emergency use authorization of, of what we would like to see from a licensed vaccine, yet they're not quite licensed, okay? So they're getting close. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, the guidance was trying to explain that, um, explain what we expe expected, and to reassure the public that we were gonna have a transparent advisory committee meeting for each and every emergency use authorization that comes through so that people understand that they'll be able to hear these vaccines presented. They'll be able to hear experts discussing them. They'll be able to get the materials um, that uh, are, are submitted by the company and that the FDA puts forth uh, about these vaccines. So among other things and the guidance that you're providing to companies uh, with that goal in mind of uh, safety and effectiveness, and as you said, close as possible to a full approval, that would include seeing the trials go through to their hard clinical endpoints on reducing infections and also reducing serious infections. That would be in there. That would um, certainly be in there. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, um, collection of a lot, a big database on safety in these large uh, tens of thousands of patients who are getting, um, uh, who are in the studies for uh, say a couple of months or, or potentially longer after uh, their vaccine doses. Uh, that would certainly be, that was already in our guidance that we put out yeah. earlier on these. So we, we, we are going to have um, large databases here of, of patients um, you know, typically our vaccines have had somewhere between 8,000 and 160,000 person years of follow-up when a BLA is, um, is issued. Now here, it'll probably be, uh, if we if do an emergency use authorization, it'll probably be a quarter or, or possibly it, it could be even a half of that, a quarter to a half of this. Um, so the person years of follow-up won't be quite as large to start. But we, we have these excellent surveillance systems, and that's something that's really come along in the past five to 10 years. That's not something that we had back in 1976 with swine flu, and we yeah. certainly didn't have it back um, in the 50s. So these are 
Uh, these are really um, systems that can help us. We know they can detect signals uh, from previous experience. Um, and so uh, we'll use those to the fullest extent. Again, I'm not trying to falsely reassure anyone because could, you know, there, we have to be always be cautious when uh, we're approving products because that's what we're paid to be. We're paid to be cautious and to really care about the health of the American people for vaccines and make sure they're safe uh, and effective and do what they're supposed to do. Um, but we also have to balance the fact that I would, you know, for, you know to, to remove every last doubt possible um, could also lead to loss of life if we require the bar to be so high um, that we uh, that we you know follow and dog down every last possible uh, adverse event to the last possible time, um, uh, particularly if the vaccine has a very good safety profile overall. Otherwise, mm -hmm. not said in the most elegant way, but the bottom line is we're going to do our job to make sure that we do the right benefit risk calculation. Uh, so that a safe, effective, quality vaccine gets out there um, uh, to help people as soon as it possibly can. And before there is an FDA decision, as you said, there's going to be a meeting for each of these vaccines with that public independent, a public meeting with that independent advisory committee with a chance for FDA to comment in writing about everything they've seen on the vaccine. All and all that discussion is a basis before any written FDA decision about a vaccine. Yeah, I'm not sure it's going to meet. It may not make every, the maybe not every. writing, TV watching, is some other things. But um, we intend to webcast this. Um, there will be an open public hearing. I suspect that there'll be some academics that will have opinions about the safety or efficacy of the vaccine, and they'll say them. Um, there may be others that have opinion about the vaccine, but that dialogue is very important. Um, and our ability to have this public process is very important because at the end of the day, we need people to have trust in this. And that's why I'm very thankful to you and the other uh, six commissioners um, uh, who, who have put together uh, uh, this editorial of support. We need to come together as a scientific community we need to let our differences aside and come together to really have trust in the power of safe and effective vaccines. Um, they eliminated smallpox from this earth. They've basically, uh, if people would actually take the vaccines, have eliminated measles and polio um, and, and several other infectious diseases from our shores. We can do this. We can but we really have to just come together as a scientific and medical community um, and, and, and regain the trust uh, of people um, in the vaccine. Well, Peter, I really appreciate the clear guidance you're providing about uh, the, the scientific basis and the public and transparent basis for doing that. I uh, uh, want to thank both of you for all you're doing. We've run a little bit over. This was a really interesting discussion. I appreciate you taking the extra time. If I could ask just uh, one last quick question. Um, uh, how are you all hanging in there? This is really hard work it's, uh, in the public eye. Uh, uh, what's getting you through it? Are you doing okay? Thank you. I'm doing okay. It's one foot in front of the other, Mark. <laughs> Peter, you too? I'm doing wonderfully. And you know, I, I took my uh, my lesson from someone said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. I have a wonderful dog. He <laughs> takes good care of me. I'm doing okay. <laughs> That's great. And, and you all have a wonderful, wonderful teams working with you. Uh, um, just to close out, thank you all for the service that you're providing to the country. Um, I know your families are, are all affected by this too, just like all of ours are. I'm really glad, we're really lucky to have you there. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, Ryan or Jeff, I, I think I'm turning over to, to Jeff now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McClellan, Dr. Woodcock, and Dr. Marks for a wonderful conversation this evening and for all your extraordinary leadership. I want to take a moment to thank all of our supporters this evening. I especially want to thank our innovators, Penny and Gary Abramson, the Rona and Jeffrey Abramson Foundation, and the Galena Yorktown Foundation, Marlene Malik, Ellen and Jerry Siegel, and champions AstraZeneca, Kenneth Grunley, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. 
The names and logos you've seen throughout the program are our generous supporters for tonight's event. This represents just some of our core supporters throughout the year who make what we do a reality. I also want to give a huge thanks to the staff at Friends. In these truly unprecedented times, our group of dedicated individuals has not only adapted to this new normal, but have excelled. And thank you all for being here tonight. And now I'm pleased to close this evening by sharing a short video as we embark on Friends of Cancer Research 25th anniversary. <laughs>